So, um, profilers are lying hobbiters. Um, so, it sounds like really negative, the title of the talk, that profilers are lying hobbiters. Everybody hates them. Okay, feedback. Um, so, just to make clear that profilers are a good thing, we should be using profilers. And Gollum is crazy, so anything he says we should not take too seriously. Um, so hobbits are good, but profilers are good, but on, a, on occasion uh, can be difficult to understand what they're saying uh, because they're fictional. But okay, so which this is this is a survey done by Zero Turnaround about why developers think their applications are slow. Um, and the, if, if we look beyond the sort of database queries and we look to one side, we see that uh, a lot of people think that inefficient application code is the problem. Now, if inefficient application code is the problem, how do we find out what part of our application is the problem? Which leads to the question, do you even profile? Most developers um, don't. How many people here have used the profiler ever before? Okay, this is a talk about profilers you would think most people have. Uh, how many people have used the profiler in the last week? Okay. Good, that's a good percentage. The, um, this is a breakdown from the same survey about how many people use particular profilers. Uh, and you will see that there's a combination of people who use none and some people who use don't know, which to me indicates they're not probably using a profiler, they just they don't feel comfortable talking about it. Um, some people use other. I think this is a hugely uh, optimistic view. My experience is that something like 70%, 50% at least of developers never use profilers. Um, that's probably because it's not taught at universities and the people get to performance very late in the development cycle for all sorts of reasons. A lot of people don't profile, so when they come to improve the performance of their code, they are just working in the dark. Uh, when people do profile, uh, most of them use JVisual VM or flavors of JVisual VM. Who here uses JVisual VM to profile their applications? You, I'll get to you later. This is Mr. Pangan, he is a liar. Okay, so we're gonna be talking about sampling profilers, so let's just cover what, what it is that they should be doing. Sampling profilers sample your program at an interval, they collect a stack trace, and the assumption is that the distribution of these samples over time will highlight um, hotspots by you know, collecting a lot of samples in the same place. Um, that assumption is based on two things. One is that samples are random, and two, that the distribution um, of these samples sort of represents the time spent. And this is where um, things can become a bit confusing uh, because for many profilers, the number of samples doesn't really correlate to time spent, it correlates to number of samples taken, uh, which is not the same thing. So we'll get to that in a minute, um, but the view of the world is something like this, it's raining samples on our code, um, and the, the flaw in sampling profilers that is often pointed out by people writing tracing profilers is that you can miss things, like that uh, method up there uh, called from new person, there's a sample to the left of it, there's a sample to the right of it, but we, we can't see it because we never got a sample inside that method. And that's where the taking lots of samples and the distribution of these samples representing what it is that happened, statistically speaking, is important. If you have a sampling profiler and it collected 10, 10 samples, then perhaps that's not representative enough. Maybe you should run it for longer. Maybe you should sample more often. Uh, but you need a lot of samples to get a picture of what's happening. And then, once we, you know, we want to improve our code, 
how do we find that line of code that is the problem? So we're going to start by looking for a line of code that is slow. Uh, we want to find the, the slow line of code. We're going to optimize it, then we're going to win. It's going to be great. And then if we take this sort of single method view on sampling, we have one method and then we sample it and hopefully we catch the really, really slow, method, slow lines. Um, so here's my super important method. Um, and if you look at it and you try to guess where, where could it possibly um, be that the most, the slowest line of code is, um, line one and line 13 are not necessarily going to jump out as problematic, right? Um, which brings us to um, JVisual VM, which most people use. What is the problem with JVisual VM? Why are you, most people use it because it's always been in the box. It always comes as part of your distribution, and it works with all the JVMs. Um, most Java profilers suffer from something called safe point bias. Who knows what safe point bias is? OK, cool. So hang in there. We'll move on to something you don't know in a minute. Um, so profilers that suffer from safe point bias only sample at a safe point, or specifically at a safe point pool. Um, each sample tends to be a safe point operation. And each sample tends to include all threads. That's not necessarily um, you know, something they have to do, but it's something they tend to do. And the way it ends up looking is I have the green Java threads. Those threads are in JVM sort of language. They're, they're the mutator threads. I need to bring them to a safe point. What I do is I raise a flag. I say I want everybody to go to a safe point. And they continue running until they hit something called the safe point pull in the execution. And safe point pulls aren't everywhere. Um, so one thread might hit it almost immediately, and another thread might spend a long time executing before they reach that uh, safe point pull. So we see one thread stopping, the middle thread is stopping uh, a long time before the um, right hand side uh, thread is stopping. Uh, and once they get to a safe point, we can run the safe point operation um, and then resume execution. On the, the red thread is a native thread. And native threads don't need to come to a safe point because the JVM has no way of making them come to a safe point. Um, so even when you have stop the world pauses and safe point operations are effectively stop the world pauses, it doesn't mean all the threads have to stop. Native threads can continue operating and often do, um, or Java threads in native operations. So safe point pause is the place where I can stop and see what the code is doing. Uh, safe point pauses tend to happen on method exit um, or on method entry in Zing. Um, and some loops will have safe point pause in them. So loops that the JVM considers to be long running or loops where it's convenient to have a safe point pull will have a safe point pull in them, but most loops won't. And when we look at this code that is super important uh, and we profile it, um, what uh, the safe point bias kind of view on this uh, on this method is, is, you know, there's three possible places for a safe point here. So there's line 5, there's line 10, and there's line 13. Um, at a guess, who thinks all of the blame is going to fall on line 5? Just pick a line. Who thinks it's going to be line 13? OK. Who thinks it's line 10? OK. Most people are non-committal. Um, that's probably a good idea. If anybody asks you a question about performance, always say it depends, and you'll probably be right. Um, and this, in this case, 100% um, of the blame is on none of these lines. It's on the loop line. Okay, the first loop is getting all the blame. Now, if you read the code, it's, it doesn't do anything in, important, but there's two loops here that are iterating over a buffer. The execution time will, will depend on the size of this buffer. If I pick a very long buffer, I should get at least some cycles in the second loop. And maybe even I would like to get a breakdown within this loop. Um, 
Also, didn't I just say that the save point pool should be on method exit uh, or in a loop? So why is it only in one loop and not the other one? Um, as it turns out, that first loop had a save point in it. It has a save point in it because there's a volatile load. Um, there's a volatile field that I'm reading in it. Um, and then the loop doesn't get unrolled, and the compiler sticks a save point pool in it, and all the blame goes to that first line. So we've learned something. We learned that if you're going to blame a loop, you're going to blame the first line a loop. That's OK. But um, now that I've hoisted it out, who's going to get all the blame? And it turns out that Oracle blames nothing. This method is invisible even though this is the only method actually doing work in this benchmark, uh, Zing will blame the first line for everything. So this is quite a confusing view of the world, um, which leads me to this point here. Uh, safe point bias profiles are absolutely useless. Um, I know it's the tool that comes in the box traditionally. I know it works with all JVMs. They're very, very unreliable and potentially very, very misleading, uh, and there's better options out there. So um, if you're profiling with JVisualVim, don't stop profiling. You should be profiling. Just move on to a better profiler. And we'll talk about better profilers now. So mission control uh, has been with us for, I think, five years now as part of OpenJDK, probably. Uh, who's using Mission Control? Java Flight Recorder? Awesome. Java Flight Recorder is a better profiler. Um, and better profilers don't have safe point bias. So how do they work? They sample at a signal. They don't need to wait for threads to get to a safe point. They can sample them at any point. OK, so a signal goes off. There's a signal handler, picks up the phone, takes a sample. Each sample will include one thread. They don't stop all the threads. They only stop threads that are executing, and they only stop one thread at a time. Um, and then, you know, there's a bunch of these profilers around. Um, Oracle Studio is different, even though it uses similar underlying structures for some of it. So uh, there's Java Mission Control, there's Honest Profiler, and there's Async Profiler, and there's differences between them. Uh, if I use any one of these on this super important method, I don't get a better result. I get a crap profile. And the reason I get a crap profile is because the JVM is clever. And the JVM is clever. It knows most of you guys don't use a good profiler. You only use the crap profilers which is why it doesn't uh, keep the debug information required to give you a more precise profile. So you need to enable it. Um, by default, there's very little debug info. It's not only at safe point polls, but it's pretty close to it. Um, so if you're going to use a better profiler, you need to enable this flag. If you don't enable this flag, you're back to square one. Your profiler will just lie to you. Um, it should be the default. There's no, I mean, there's, there's uh, probably slightly more memory usage as a result of using this flag. But as far as I know, that's very minor and unlikely to be a problem. So it should be on by default, um, in my opinion, but it isn't. So add it to your list of favorite flags. Uh, and then you can plug in a profiler and actually see something more meaningful. OK, and when we do that, we get a profile that seems a lot more reasonable. Okay? We see that there's two lines in the loop that are actually doing something and are getting blamed. Uh, we see that the second loop does have some of the attribution. It seems like a simpler mathematical operation, so it gets less of the attribution. This is a profile that sort of makes sense. Okay? This is not a bad place to be if you're looking for opportunities uh, to optimize. From this point onwards, though, you have to just use your brain and decide what is it about a particular line that is slow and how can I make it faster. Um, and that's when you tend to use a, a deeper profiler. Um, before we go on to another profiler, 
There's a problem with mission control. Even when you have the uh, debug information, um, and it's, it's a problem of a mission. So what is, what is wrong with the Java Flight Recorder? The Java Flight Recorder um, doesn't tell you when it fails to collect a sample. So when you look at your profile and there's you know, 1,003 samples, you don't know about the 2,000 times when it tried to collect a sample and failed. Um, there's two particular cases that are very, very um, problematic here. One is um, stubs or generated stubs that the JVM generates to um, implement operations that should be very fast, like array copies, uh, like CRC32, some of the string operations. And the JFR, for reasons that we won't go into, just can't walk the stack when uh, it picks up a sample at that point. Now, this becomes kind of a, a feedback loop that uh, stops you from complaining to the JVM developers about these stubs. So they've improved them, and they've made them invisible at the same time. Uh, so now you can no longer see that your application is doing array copies. Um, so that's one problem here. Uh, the other problem is that in many cases, um, if you're in native code, like network code, um, the, the mission control fails to collect the stack. I'm not sure why, uh, because it's not using async control call trace, which is the callback that uh, Honest Profiler is using. Uh, and in this case, Honest Profiler does a better job. So you're not, you're not going to see those stacks. And the last thing is, it completely ignores native threads. So if your application is spending a lot of CPU in native threads, you're just not going to see it. So it limits your view to a very partial um, part of your application, which means you'll focus your efforts on the wrong side of your code, which means your optimizations will go nowhere. Uh, Honest Profiler reports failed samples. It reports them as failed. So it's perhaps not that informative, but at least you know something went wrong. Right? You still can't see stubs, but you can see you know, that you didn't see them, which is better than completely ignoring the fact that they happened. And native code, while showing up as a failed sample, you don't know what happened. So native code, such as GC, such as compiler, is, again, invisible to this profiler. The last one in this family is async profiler. Um, Failed samples are reported, but more than that, um, they're minimized. So it makes uh, an extra effort to recover samples in, in stubs um, or samples that happen to fall on the uh, edge between methods. Um, so it has very, very few broken samples, which is good. Uh, it shows native, uh, both the user and the kernel uh, on Linux. Um, it's, uh, it also, I think it, it's, if it's not already working, then it's in process of being working on uh, Mac OS, and it may never make it to Windows. So if you're on Windows, this is not happening for you. Um, it currently doesn't support line of code precision, but you can at least see uh, an accurate picture of where your time is spent within methods, um, which is something. So just to, to underline the state of the world as I see it here, you can use Java Flight Recorder. It's not perfect, but it's much better than JVisual VM. Uh, if you're going to use it, you have to enable the debug non-safe points flag. Um, to find out whether or not you're getting lots of failed samples, um, you'll have to do the maths about how many samples you expect to see and how many samples you actually see in your profile. So if you see, you know, this method has 10% of the samples, and that's 100 samples, then you overall collected 1,000 samples. And if you've been collecting that over an hour and you only got 1,000 samples, then maybe you're missing something. Um, the, the maths need to work out in terms of um, 
how many samples I expect to see based on how long I ran the profile and the CPU utilization. So they, they need to somehow reconcile. Um, to show you how the different pictures end up looking, hey, we're going to look at this. Um, anybody here familiar or comfortable with flame graphs? Who knows what a flame graph is? Excellent. The rest of you, um, you know, just look it up. Right. Uh, flame graphs are a visual representation of stacks. The important thing for this talk is the wider the frame is, the more samples it collected. So this is a benchmark, benchmarking a, uh, a JSON serializer. And we can see that the reflection array get is the worst operation here. This is a profile collected with JSTAC, so uh, similar to what you'd get from JVisualVM. Now, granted, you know, picking up elements from an array using reflection is not a good idea. But 50% of the profile seems a bit excessive. Now, if we take that and we look at what we would get with JFR, we would get a very different picture. Um, and we can see that here, Mr. Array get is not so much of a problem. Um, but this, this one, JSON write the string, is getting uh, a lot more samples. So this is, this is pointing us a lot closer to where we should be looking. But if we're looking at this profile, and we're thinking, this is, you know, I'll just optimize my Java code, and everything is going to be fine. I need to find some, you know, some operation, maybe some arithmetic that I'm doing, um, something that I can optimize. And you're looking at, your, um, at this profile, you're looking at the wrong thing. Because this profile completely ignores um, native threads. And if we look at the full picture for this profile, um, we see that, yes, we're spending time in Java. So again, because this is not a talk about flame graphs, I'm not going to go into exactly what everything means here. But um, these threads, which make up 40% of the profile, um, are GC threads. And this benchmark has been run with a very small heap. So it's spending a lot of time doing GCs. Maybe if I just change the JVM parameters, give it more room to grow, it would run a lot, fa a lot faster. But if I'm only looking at the Java profile, I'm just not going to see it. Now, if you're using something like JFR, you can look at uh, the garbage collection statistics as well. And a lot of people, for their real applications, they would have a GC log. But now we're talking about trying to reconcile the GC log with your application profile. When did I take this uh, profile? How does it fit in with the GC? Was the GC executing concurrently? Or was it um, you know, a parallel pause? Um, trying to, to make all of that fit can be very hard. Whereas if, if we just looked at the CPU profile with a tool that shows us both sides of, of the JVM, then we can just see what's happening. Uh, and we're not deluding ourselves. OK. So talked about omission control. We talked about the different profiles that we can use here. Um, but underneath it all, um, we know that the CPU executes instructions. Anybody here heard about CPUs? Knows about instructions? Yes. OK. So when we say the JVM is executing code, what do we mean? Um, if your code is actually run you know, enough times, it'll get compiled. So even before that, we don't, we don't run code. We run bytecode. Okay, we take your code, we compile it into bytecode. The JVM doesn't understand Java, it understands bytecode. Um, but then, once we've compiled it, with a JIT compiler, there's no more bytecode. The bytecode index is, is a figment of our imagination. The JVM um, runs native code if it's hot code. So, we're looking at instructions, and if you want to sample instructions, the way traditional profilers work is they sample the program counter. If you've done a CS degree, then 
this might sound familiar. The instruction pointer or the program counter is what we're looking at. So the instruction point pointer is a register that contains the offset to the next instruction to be executed. And that's important. It's not pointing at the instruction that is being executed. It's the next instruction that is getting executed. Um, and this, this uh, lovely picture of children going into a meat grinder um, is not entirely dissimilar to what happens inside your computer. We take little children. Uh, okay, we take instructions, and this is the, the sort of the, the pipeline that instructions go through. They uh, get fetched, then they get decoded, then they get executed, and then uh, they retire. And the program counter point to the next instruction to go into this lovely meat grinder. So it's already a couple of instructions behind the, in the pipeline. Um, now, how do we sample this, this register that we, we make our judgments on? We, um, we install a signal handler. We set up a counter, some event, usually it cycles. So every thousand cycles, we're going to get a um, signal. And then our signal handler gets a micro context. The micro context will have the value of the program counter with the instruction pointer. And then we can marry that with the assembly. Everybody loves assembly. Uh, so this is some assembly I got from uh, PerfASM, which is the assembly profiler that's plugged into the GMH framework. Okay. Now if we're looking at the assembly instructions on the left-hand side, um, you'll see that there are percentages of how many cycles we attribute to each instruction. So this is how it works. We collect samples, and then we blame particular instructions for what just happened. Um, so we had this method, we had those attributions. You'll notice that the line with the multiplication um, gets roughly 66%, 66.6. The percentage of the beast goes to that multiplication line. Um, and if we look at the assembly, we can see that there's a division instruction here. Uh, followed by a move between two registers. How much should a move between two registers cost? Does anybody know? Nothing. nothing. Well done. Moving between two registers costs nothing. Why are we spending eight or nearly nine percent of the time on doing nothing? Something that should, should cost us nothing. And the key observation here is that this is not the instruction that we should be blaming, the instruction before it, which is the division, is the one where all the effort is being uh, made. So that's the beginning of the problem here. So looking at, at instructions should be good, right? We have the precision of instructions, and we have accuracy that is cycle-ish, right? And ish is, is not a bad definition of it. So this is, um, I, I love this exchange because it's an exchange between two very experienced people and it goes to show that this is confusing to everyone. So this is um, Brendan Gregg, who's a big performance dude, works for Netflix these days, used to work for Joyent. And this is a man who looks at profilers all day long. And then he's saying, I think Andy mentioned this to me last year, that instruction profiling was no longer reliable. Andy Clean, who works for Intel um, on maintaining the perf profiler for Linux, um, comes back and says, it never worked. I don't know what you're talking about. These things were never reliable. Um, and, and there's issues here both with our mental model and with what the tools can do. Okay. The issue from a statistics point of view here is that instructions don't have uniform costs. So looking at the next thing to execute um, and thinking that is a good way of sampling, that assumes all instructions are pretty much equal. And then statistics-wise, this is all going to just come out in the wash uh, because sampling one instruction over another 
should you know, just work out statistically. But if some instructions are more expensive, they are, by virtue of being more expensive, will make the instructions after them look bad and themselves um, look more and more invisible. So that difference in cost affects the sort of profile you're going to see. But there's other, other factors here as well. Um, CPUs are not the simple beasts we have in our minds. So the pipeline, and that's the pipeline we, we sort of show in that image. Um, so there's one instruction getting executed. Um, and while we're doing that, we're fetching, we're decoding. Any one of those stages might be the bottleneck for our CPU. But in our head, we sort of captured all of it as executing. And not only that, CPUs are super scalar, which means they execute more than one instruction at a time. So there's a lot of parallelism happening within your CPU. Um, so taking this view that the next instruction to be executed is the most indicative of what's going on within the CPU is not dissimilar to taking a, a look at a database uh, and saying the next query um, to be executed, that's the one I'm going to blame for the time being spent within the database. Um, you're likely to be close in time, but you know, potentially quite far from the, uh, where, where the actual cost lies. Um, this is made even worse by the fact that CPUs can execute instructions out of order. Um, they can execute instructions speculatively. All of this um, and the signal latency of, of uh, the, the profilers adds up to this observation. If you're profiling using an instruction profiler, um, you probably already made this observation yourselves. Uh, but most people don't use an instruction profiler, so it's important to understand this, that we often place the blame shortly after where the cost is. Now, if you're looking at assembly, which is unpleasant, um, but if you're doing that, that's probably not a massive issue. Uh, even then, there's some improvements you can have. Uh, so Intel came up with uh, the precise event-based sampling. Um, if, if you're trying to profile and this is a problem for you, this is something you need to be looking at, uh, and it's particularly effective for uh, branches and cache events and for instructions. Okay, um, you, you look at perf list, you'll, you'll get a more uh, coherent list of events that you can be precise about. Um, and that eliminates some of the issue. It eliminates the, the skid issue of the signal. It doesn't eliminate uh, the rest of it. It doesn't eliminate the complexity of the CPU or the fact that you, you would tend to uh, blame potentially the, the wrong thing. Um, okay, so how, how broken is this tool? It's got limited accuracy, but if you understand that there's limited accuracy, there's something you can do about it. Um, if you're looking at an instruction profiler, and there's a few examples here, so you can use Oracle Studio, you can use uh, VTune or ZVision, uh, ZVision is for, for Zing, um, then you can, if, if you're looking at the instructions and you scroll a few lines back, you can often make sense of this. Um, and the problem is we don't like assembly, right? Uh, if we did, we wouldn't be Java programmers. So I, mean, I spent three years working for Azure, staring at a lot of assembly. After three years, I can say I, I learned to love it. So it's not something uh, you, know, you grow to love, I think. So we, we want to get back to our lines of code. Okay? How do we get back from the instructions to a line of code? So we, we try and reverse engineer. Where did this instruction come from? So we start by trying to trace the bytecode index, the bytecode that generated the instruction. Um, so we need to think about where do instructions come from. We just had two talks on this track about where instructions come from. They come from compilers, right? Um, but how do compilers map bytecodes to instructions? How do they come up with that translation? And what sort of information they give you about translating it back? So sometimes a single bytecode will translate to a single instruction. 
and that would make sense, right? Sometimes, and this is sort of the intuitive case, because we think bytecodes are more high level than instructions, one bytecode would translate to lots of instructions. This is, you know, a good mapping to work with. I have an instruction, it came from a single bytecode, I can find a line of code this, all of this boils down to. Sometimes, a lot of bytecodes would translate to a single instruction because it turns out that the processor you're working with has a, maybe a single instruction that is very clever and can just capture what you meant in several bytecodes in a single instruction. This is still manageable. Where things get a bit fuzzy uh, is when you have lots of bytecodes translated into a pile of assembly. Um, those bytecodes are not necessarily all from the same line of code because let's say I'm trying to do the same if statements five times within my method because I'm a messy programmer, okay? And the profiler is clever. It can find all these conditions and put them into a single condition. Which if statement should get blamed for that bytecode? Or sorry, which, which if statement should I blame for those cycles that I blamed on the instruction? So there's this sort of splitting of, of blame that should happen, but there's no debug info in place to support that. Finally, some instructions just come, as far as the bytecode is concerned, they come out of nowhere. So we talked about save points. Save point pause are a good example of assembly code that has nothing to do with your bytecodes. Your bytecode, you don't care about save point pause in your code. The JVM adds that so it can do its thing. But if the cost is in that code, you would still get the blame in the Java code, which can be very confusing. Um, those are cases where you really have to go down to the instruction level and profile. It's not that common, but it can happen. So it works well for some cases. Uh, if it doesn't work well, we just pick by proximity. We just pick the first uh, bytecode that we can find and blame that one. Um, and again, if you don't enable debug non save points, that can be a very long way off. So keep that flag on. Okay, we found the bytecode. Now we want to find the line of code. Um, something very, very similar happens. Not every bytecode comes from a line of code. We have tools that generate bytecode. Um, so again, we just find the closest. So we have this sort of mapping that, you know, mostly works. Um, if you're going to look at lines of code, this is as good as it gets for your uh, Java um, profiling. And you can try and look for other suspects nearby. Um, the problem is that nearby is not as meaningful as we would like it to be. So if we were looking at the assembly, the assembly has an ordering that is visible when you look at the assembly. When you're looking at your Java code um, and you think this is what's gonna happen, my lines are going to get executed in sequential order and it's all going to be great, you're ignoring the f a lot of the work that compilers do. And compil compilers just remix your code, okay? The compiler is free to reorder all these lines of code doing all sorts of optimizations. Um, these are just a few, um, but at the end of this, your nice code um, can just get reordered and uh, you know, lines 10, 5, and 6 will become one instruction. Um, you know, the next line wouldn't even be from your code. All of it can get, can get rehashed. And once that happened, and you take into account that you could be a few instructions off, um, the distance in instructions and the distance in code are not similar because the distance in instructions might be just, you know, four instructions, but you could be, you know, tens of lines of codes apart once, you know, some code has been eliminated and some code has been reordered and so on and so forth. So, it almost kind of works, but um, sometimes it doesn't. So, if you're looking at a profile and it just doesn't seem to make sense, don't blindly follow the, uh, the profile, maybe look at the assembly.
I say maybe because it shouldn't be the first place you look, but, you know, give it a chance. Okay, so, if we can't find the line of code, surely we can find the method that we should blame, right? We have an instruction, can we blame the right method? Um, we should be able to do this, and the way this works is we have a program counter, we have a range of instructions that came from a method, and if the instruction falls within that range, we know who to blame, okay? This is how the mapping should work. Um, then we find the slow methods, optimize, win. Great. Now, if that worked, the save point poor thing should at least be accurate on a method level, right? Because on a method exit or entry, we have a save point poor. Um, I take you back to the fact that Oracle blamed 0% on this method. So if that worked, we should have seen something here, right? Um, the thing is, because OpenJDK knows that the save point poor is the last thing in the method, it's like, well, I know this, this is not meaningful code. I'll just blame the person who called this method for the cost. So you're still going to have to look at a line of code within the method that called your method. Uh, and that might be an indication of where the issue lies. Um, the problem is that sometimes your method disappears. Sometimes methods go away. And this is called inlining. Um, Chris mentioned inlining. Um, I, I wasn't here for the talk after that, but I'm sure he talked about inlining as well. Inlining is often referred to as the mother of all optimizations. Um, who knows what method inlining is? Excellent. Well done, people. Right, so we replace a method call with a method. It's a great optimization. It enables a range of other optimizations. But when we do that, we remove the save point poor. So if I have method A calls B calls C, everything gets inlined. I only get the save point poor at the end of method A. So all that granularity in between has just gone away. That um, makes this picture where we have things that should happen in order of methods just as mixed up as the picture we have with lines of code. So now, and this is where things get really confusing. When you look at a profile, and because you are imprecise to the scale of, say, three or four or five instructions, you are looking at the wrong method in the wrong class, in the wrong sort of code base, so you're miles away from where you should be. And inlining is, you know, is wonderful, but it really um, generates a confusing reality for profilers to look at, especially when they try and reverse engineer your code out of it. So, inlining can create great confusion. Um, the solution to this problem is to have inlining information. Inlining information is not readily available in most profilers. Um, if you're looking at perf map agent with perf with flame graphs, you can get a visualization of uh, which methods got in line, which methods didn't, and that'll give you some indication of the reliability of the profile you're looking at, as well as do I, am, I, am I looking at an inlining issue? Um, I know um, we were just discussing it, um, async profiler might get support for this kind of visibility in the future. Um, and if you're using Oracle Studio, you can sort of get this uh, visibility by flipping between the expert view and the machine view. So on the machine, machine level view, you would only see uh, real methods. And on the, um, on the expert view, you will see the core stack as it happens in Java. So by deducting one from the other, you might end up with a, a better view of the world. Uh, inlining scope if you look at it, um, is very wide, which is a very good thing because we want inlining to happen at a, at a good range. Um, but we end up with a picture that looks something like this. So that means a lot of code can end up in one method, rehashed, remixed, um, and, and effectively eliminated in many cases. So 
this is uh, uh, an image of that same uh, JSON benchmark, and we can see here on the on the right hand side um, some lucky class from uh, the Google library um, ended up inlining I think all the way up to nine methods and then some. Um, so again, inlining is a, is a very real thing to happen to your code, and especially in Java code where you have lots of tiny methods because tiny methods are good and they all get shuffled around, this can very quickly become um, a cause of issue. So method granularity kind of works most of the time, but if you look at a profile where it just doesn't seem to make sense, maybe you should look at the assembly maybe you should trace a few lines back. Okay. Now, methods. We said lines of code aren't real. Methods aren't real either because of inlining, but methods aren't real on another level. So if, if you're using a native profiler and you're supposed to have this sort of relationship with the process you're profiling, usually they rely on static debug info because they use the ahead of time compiled applications. Um, for Java, there is no such thing. So you need to use a, a special agent uh, to generate that or use an internal profiler to get that information of what instructions mean with relation to, um, to methods. That's okay. That's a solved problem. Okay. Now we have compilation over time. So we start in the interpreter. Let's call that version zero of, of the method. Then we have version one generated by the C1 uh, client. Then we have version two typically from uh, the C2 compiler. Then we have version three because we've hit the optimization at some point. Then we have version four when we've hit the optimization again, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, there's, there's no theoretical limit to how many versions of a method uh, the JVM will see. In one, uh, you know, in one profile, it tends to be two or three at a maximum. And if you take your profile late into the uh, application run, in all probability, you will see the same version of the same method. But if you're profiling two different versions of the same method, mixing the two together is quite misleading. You are spending time in the same method but they're very, two very different versions of the same method. Um, there's a further issue here with inlining. So if, if you're looking at a method and you're collecting a blame for it uh, across inlined call sites as well as real call sites, then you're again looking at different versions and essentially each call site is a different version. So if I call method B from method A, method B from method C, the two versions generated are potentially different versions. And if I try and collect the blame for them together, I will probably end up with a confusing picture. Finally, um, as if that wasn't enough, we have uh, the issue of utilization and how it correlates with profiles. So. If we're comparing method utilization and we want to find the bottleneck for our application, so we have method A getting 20% of the samples, method B getting 80% of the samples, it's obvious that we should optimize method B, right? Because that's where all the samples are. But that is ignoring the reality here. So this is a confusing profile. I'll try to point out the highlight here. It's also very small font, but okay. We have some very, very deep call stacks here, um, but we will notice that process epo events that I'm pointing to here, that's getting 13%, and this guy is getting 30%. So if I'm looking to optimize this, the threads that call you know, the, the epoll threads in this application, I would tend to think that what I need to optimize is this side of the profile. But if I break down the profile by thread, I'll see that there's two very distinct versions of, of this uh, profile. In one case, I have this thread here, 
This thread collects you know, 760 samples of the theoretical 1,000 samples that it can collect. Okay, so this thread is running at 76% CPU. All the other threads are pretty idle by comparison, and also they're only executing this side of the core stack. So because there's a lot of this, this is a relationship that you will tend to see in uh, SEDA applications where there's one thread feeding a, a thread pool, and the thread pool can be quite large. The thread pool code will look as if it's dominating the application, but it could be that the threads feeding the thread pool are the bottleneck, and those are the ones that need to either be paralyzed or optimized. Um, so having this view on utilization is not something that most profilers give readily. Um, you can get a per thread breakdown with some profilers, um, and if it is available to you, I recommend you make sense of it. Um, Okay, so to make sense of this concurrent profile, um, we need to record the expected max sample so that we know what sort of utilization we're looking at, and we need information by thread ID. Information by thread is uh, available in JFRs. Uh, it is available in uh, perf map agent, perf combination, and it is soon to be available in uh, async profiler. Um, again, yet another sort of prism to look through at, at your code base. And with that, unsatisfying profilers lie to us all the time. Why did they do that kind of conclusion? Um, we move to questions. Thank you. I, I was going to say thank you anyway. But yeah, let's have questions first. Sorry. So, a silly question. What about instrument profilers? Instrumentation? Okay. Um, instrumenting profilers are often problematic because they change the application in order to uh, give you a view of what it's doing. And especially when you're trying to get um, good granularity of what's happening, uh, you'll potentially end up adding so much reporting that the uh, application is in fact spending most of its time taking timestamps rather than actually executing code. Now, it doesn't have to be that way. You can pick a better granularity. Uh, and then you're, you've got this sort of balance between an instrumenting profiler and sort of a tracing tool. Um, it has its place, but the granularity um, you're likely to end up with on modern CPUs, because they're so fast, uh, if, if you take a few millisec a few microseconds between timestamps, which is a reasonable thing to do if you're taking timestamps, uh, a few microseconds is a lot of instructions. It's a lot of code that is invisible to you between those timestamps. Thank you. More questions? Поднимайте руку, пожалуйста, выше, если кто-то хочет задать вопрос. Could you share which tools are you using to get information on uh, your, your slide in white code? So I use, um, I use perf with perf map agent and flame graph, uh, and I use uh, async profiler. Um, that's sort of a combination. Async profiler tends to generate much cleaner profiles, um, but it doesn't show me the inlining data. Um, so I, I tend to sort of contrast one with the other. Uh, and I use Java Flight Recorder, but not for the, um, the code profile. I use it just because it, it captures a bunch of other appl uh, application um, stats all at the same time. So what I end up doing is running uh, the perf profiler and the flight recorder on the same time slice. So they're both working in parallel. Uh, and then I can have a view on uh, GC events, 
uh, compilation events, um, other sort of machine level statistics that Java Flight Recorder collects very well, uh, as well as a good CPU profile. Two short questions. Uh, first of all, uh, how to get these nice green flame graphs? You know, I tried to use this uh, Perl script and it generates like awesome colors, I don't know. They are always broken. Even if I use uh, Java options, some kind of Java option. Okay. Um, there's quite a few blog posts on how to get this running and I'll, I'll point you at them if you come ask me after, the, after we're done. Okay. Okay. And another one. What about this, you know, split by thread flame graph? Is this some kind of mod of this? Is yes, this you, you need to um, collapse the profile uh, with a different flag. I have a blog post on how to get this working for Java exactly um, on, so there's instructions out there. Thank you. Thank you very much for a nice talk. Um, my question is, you mentioned several problems of different profilers. Could you please summarize what are the problems of studio profilers, studio performance analyzer and collect? So, um, Oracle Studio is a very, very good tool. The problem of using it um, on on Linux that is not the Oracle Linux is that, um, as far as I know, attaching to a running process doesn't work. So you can collect, if you're just doing testing, you can collect a process. Yeah, you can, but uh, you also can start from the beginning, collect and uh, yes. activate by signal. Okay. So it's the same and it has zero overhead until you don't connect. Okay, so it is, it is an option. You can use it. Um, it's good for OpenJDK. It's a great profiler. Most people uh, find it difficult to use. I think more people should use it. Uh, it's also very well hidden on where do I download it, how do I get it working. Um, it's one of the tools that people who work on the JVM tend to use yeah. and not so much so externally. Yes. Yeah. I'm, what I'm asking for, do you know the real problems in the accuracy of this tool? Because I so, know that the barrier is really high and uh, that's, for me, the main problem why this tool is not used widely. Although it's used, as you said, in the GVM team, mm -hmm. and uh, Charlie Hunt is the, uh, so the most uh, favorite tool. If you're, if so you're, looking, if you're looking at um, sort of contrasting it with other tools, so A, there's not a lot of adoption. It works in certain environments, but, you know, it's, it's a potentially problematic proposition in others. Um, I think the profiles it generates are great uh, in terms of, you know, you get instruction profiling and the sort of Java level profiling hand in hand, which is very nice. It even does flame graphs now, apparently. Um, so, yeah, th there's no um, real issue. It, it is like, like other instruction profilers. Um, there's skid issues that are just inherent to instruction profiling. Uh, I think for most people, it's just they don't know about it, and the, you know, and and it's not a very fun tool to use. <laughs> but um, yeah, apart from that, it's it's not a bad tool. It's, uh, so you don't know the accuracy problems really, which are specific to this tool. No, look, um, if you're comparing. Uh, uh, Oracle Studio with, say, Perf. Um, Perf does better in terms of multiplexing different types of events where Studio doesn't. But they're, they're both good profilers. Um, so if, if that's your current profiler, stick with it. Um, if yes, it is, I just... Uh, yeah, so I, there you go. Maybe something to it I don't know, hidden, inaccurate, uh, and uh, lying me more than I expected to lie. No, no, it's lying to you, I suspect, just as much as you think it is lying to you. Thanks. <laughs>